Hello everyone. Dima Pobedinsky is with you. Everyone knows this on-off symbol, a stick in a circle, but what does it mean? It seems like nothing, but in fact it's binary logic. In the middle of the 20th century, engineers began to designate the on-state as one, and the off-state as zero. Over time, the two symbols merged into one, and Valia, now it looks like this. There are a lot of signs, standards, formats around us that we are so used to that we don't even think about why they are exactly like that. Socket voltage, frame rate, screen resolution, Wi-Fi ranges, Bluetooth and much more. Everything has been defined, standardized and accepted by default for a long time. But how were all these values chosen? They can be anything, but for some reason they chose only one. Of course, there are good reasons for this. And the most interesting, unexpected and confusing ones will be discussed now. We will discuss the history of power grids. And again, why are Americans not like us? The secrets of cinema and 24 frames per second of the great-grandfather of Wi-Fi and how purity was chosen for him. With Uncle Mitya, we will collect vintage lighting and phones from tablets and along the way we will figure out many more unexpected patterns around us. Let's go. So, the socket. The first thing to say, in Russia, and throughout Europe for 17 years, the standard is not 220, but 230 volts. However, give or take 10%, so the old value fits there too, but still 220 is no longer relevant. In addition, there is no such thing as 110 volts in America, and 220 in the rest of the world. Everything is much more complicated. In Japan exactly 100, in the same USA, 120, in Mexico, 127, in Afghanistan, Qatar and Kenya, as much as 240 volts. It's a whole disco of different standards. And let's figure out how it appeared. There are many versions, but the most reasonable. Thomas Edison is to blame for everything. Well, that's not surprising. Choosing the voltage for his power grids, the first in the world, by the way, he was guided by the following. The more voltage, the less current at the same power of the devices, the thinner and cheaper the wires, and most importantly, less loss in them. But the lower the voltage, the safer and less insulation is required. And now we have a bunch of types of plastic and even blue duct tape. But then Gutepercha to cellulose in gauze needed some kind of golden mean. And everything converged to the figure of 100 volts. Well, besides, the round number is generally excellent. That's just Edison used direct current, which is difficult to transmit at a distance without much loss. On the way from the station to the consumer there was a very strong voltage drop. And in order to provide a minimum of 100 volts across the entire network, 110 volts were taken as the nominal value. Yes, 10 could be lost somewhere, but the remaining ones definitely reached the address. And then it was like this. For light bulbs and low-tech, 110 volts is quite enough, but not enough for powerful devices. Therefore, they came up with the idea of getting not two, but three wires into the houses. On one, the potential is plus 110 volts, on the other, zero, and on the third, minus 110 volts. The first two go to apartments for light bulbs. There's a TV, turn on the console, a laptop, and there's a difference of 220 volts between the first and third. This voltage leads to a common room where washing machines, dryers and other powerful equipment. The profit scheme with single and double voltage, by the way, is still used in the USA, so there are often no washing machines in apartments, only a common washing room for the whole house. In AC networks, 110 volts were also used for compatibility of devices. As for Europe, its electrification began later, it became easier with insulation there. And in general, have you figured out why we need 110 volts? Let's immediately power everything from the more efficient 220. In addition, after the world wars, everything was restored, in fact, from scratch. So the standard of 220 volts was fixed. But that's not all. Before continuing, I give the floor to Uncle Mitya. He will show you something interesting. Kindly welcome everyone. And I will note that nonsense makes me study here. I'm actually radio amateurs, not homemade. Well, the experience is interesting, so I'll show you. At the turn of the 19th 20th century, all incandescent lamps were with carbon filament, but seriously, there was charred bamboo, graphite, and all that inside. And it doesn't sound very reliable, but the scheme is working. At least one such light bulb has been shining for more than a hundred years without a break. And now we are going to assemble something similar, a pencil light bulb. We will need pencil pencils, wires with crocodiles, a lead battery or several crown batteries, well, some kind of flask. Carefully attach the crocodiles to the lead, cover with a flask and feed. 
That's it, the light bulb is ready, there are enough crowns for a couple of minutes, but the battery lasts much longer. If you somehow pump out the air, then in general a light bulb for all occasions. Yes, the technology is ancient, inefficient and terribly outdated, but it is warm. You can try it yourself, but don't forget the puncture, otherwise the threads will fly apart with a bang. And I have everything at the reception. So, carbon lamps burn out quickly when the voltage increases. What prevented the US from raising it? Well, at least a little more than 110 volts, and only the appearance of tungsten filaments, devoid of this drawback, allowed it to be brought to 120 volts. A little, but again, this is for compatibility with the rest of the equipment. Now the standard in the USA is 120, 240 volts in Europe, by 1980, there were 220 in the continental part, and in Great Britain, under the influence of America, 240 volts. And it was decided to average up to 230. Done. I do not exclude that sooner or later this figure will be raised again. Well, for example, up to 400. But let's see, we're moving on. Now all computers, smartphones, smartwatches, you love other gadgets are arranged according to the same principle. There is a processor, RAM, permanent memory, binary logic is used, bits, bytes, and so on. Could it have been any different? Quite. For example, a computing machine based on ternary setting logic is known. She did not use bits, but trits, in which one of the three values can be written. Essentially 0, 1 or 2. Or yes, no, and I don't know, but seriously, there are a lot of advantages of such logic. Set negative numbers, perform operations of subtraction, rounding, separating the integer part from the fractional part. The words from the strips are shorter in length than the beaten ones. The only thing is that it is much more difficult to implement in hardware, so the scheme did not take root or the CPU. Until the 70s, there wasn't even such a thing. The computer was just a mess of different circuits, boards that performed functions soldered into them at the factory, and nothing else. In 1971, Intel released a microprocessor. At 4004, it was universal and executed, in fact, all commands on the device. Together with him, they released a chip 42, which is the world's first RAM. 4001 is a permanent memory. And in fact, such a scheme is still used today. The most interesting thing is that standards are also being set in our time, which will not be noticed after a while. Wireless headphones, inductive charging, masks in public places. And I want to tell you about the new Lenovo laptop, which also seems to set a new standard for functionality and performance. Look, a compact, powerful laptop on board the Intel Core and 5 of the latest generation of SSD for 512 gigs, 16 RAM, a 6th generation Wi-Fi fingerprint scanner, autonomy up to 10 hours. And all this in an unbreakable magnesium and aluminum case, zinc alloy hinges and a killer feature. Yes, you can finally spill water on the keyboard, there will be nothing for him at all. But the most important thing here is another screen on electronic ink. And it is a very convenient tool. For example, for negotiations. You can display the company logo, take notes, where the text is recognized and saved in the main document. In addition, a notification comes here, you can answer without opening the laptop. And of course, he practically does not eat a battery and it is most convenient to read books on it. I think this gadget is perfect for business and for all those who have every second in the account, who appreciate reliability, autonomy and durability. There will be a link in the description, there are all the details. Go ahead, study. Moving on, 24 frames per second. In the cinema, it is often said that if there is less, we will stop perceiving the change of frames as a smooth picture. But this is complete nonsense. Look, it's 15 frames per second now and everything seems to be fine. The point here is completely different. And, oddly enough, not even in the image, but in the sounds. In the days of silent films, films were recorded at 16 FPS, and they were reproduced at 2025. And the speed was changed even during the screening of the film manually to add dynamics to the mood of the audience. Well, just like now on YouTube. But sound cinema changed everything. If you change the frame rate, then it is not particularly noticeable to the eye. But if at the same time the speed of sound reproduction changes, it is all synchronized with the picture, then even the slightest deviation from the normal speed is heard. Right now I'm swimming plus or minus 10%. And how did you develop sound film formats? At 20, 22, 24 frames per second? 
The Vitaphone system with 24 was the fastest to be ready. Everyone adjusted to it. But who knows, if he had won the race, then everything could have been different for the other one. However, I note that 24 is also a great number for a multiplier. To speed up the production of cartoons, you can draw not every frame, but, for example, every second or every third, or every fourth. Just the same, 24 is divided into 2, 3, and 4. That's the magic of numbers. And yes, all this applies to film cinema. Digital cameras shoot 25 to 30 frames per second due to the fact that televisions depended on the frequency of alternating current in the network at 50 or 60 kets, depending on the country. But the choice of these values is quite simple. The higher the frequency, the more efficient the current transmission. But the smaller, the slower the generators should rotate. There should be fewer poles in them, and this is easier and cheaper. The choice is not obvious at all. So by the beginning of the 20th century in the USA and Europe there were a lot of networks with different purity. But it's not possible to combine all the disparate networks into one. It was necessary to agree on a single frequency. And, as you can see, the average of the existing ones was taken, which became a compromise for all systems. Another observation is that the frequency of Wi-Fi and microwave is the same. Coincidence, of course not. The story goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. In the 20s and 30s, it became known that ultra-high-frequency radio waves can heat food, drinks, people and animals. By the mid-40s, the companies Rayton, which produce radars and General Electric, began producing microwaves for heating food. And when choosing the purity for them, a lot of tests were carried out. Moreover, it turned out that using a resonant frequency for a water molecule of about 23 gigahertz is generally a stupid idea. A lot is reflected in, accordingly, a lot of losses. The source is difficult to produce, and everything is heated only from the outside. Completely different frequencies turn out to be optimal for warming up food. According to the totality of the penetration depth, the degree of absorption, the percentage of losses, the size of the magnetron chamber and a bunch of other parameters, their values were experimentally deduced, 915 and 2450 megahertz. And then the magic of negotiations began. In the 46th year of REIT, he proposed the following to the US Federal Communications Control Commission, and let's allocate these frequencies purely for microwaves. Well, what are they going to do there, will they drive interference? And so we will not interfere with anyone. Agreed? Well, the commission thought, thought, and 39 years later included these frequencies in the list of unlicensed. Equipment operating in these ranges does not need to be registered anywhere, registered. Well, we can say that it turned out to be such a dump in the radio spectrum, where no one controls anything and everyone lives by concepts. However, thanks to such freedom, wireless technologies for local use have flourished in this dump. In 1988, the progenitor of the Wi-Fi, our beloved, appeared, Wei Flan. It was used in cash registers, gave a speed of up to 2 megabits per second and worked at a frequency of 2450 megahertz. Well, that's what it's come to. You know yourself. All sorts of Bluetooth, mice, keyboards, remotes and other junks overwhelmed this range that Wi-Fi was even additionally allocated. But it all started with a desire to eat quickly. Well, since we're on YouTube, we need to discuss these numbers. What the hell is this anyway? Why it was impossible to make 500 for 1000, 2000, 4000, 3840, 2160 dam, for several months I remembered seriously. All because of the old thick analog TVs. In them, the image was formed by a beam of electrons, which, line by line, passed at breakneck speed all over the screen. At the same time, each line was analog, no pixels, so the formats differed precisely in the number of lines. So, in the 40s, the NSC standard was developed, using 525 lines. And this number was not chosen by chance. The purity of the non-beam run, which was set by the generator, was calculated as follows, the network frequency multiplied by the number of lines. It seems simple, but vacuum tubes of those years did not know how to operate with such large numbers. I had to consistently multiply by small values, by 2, by 3, by 4, by 5. The developers planned to exceed 500 lines. That's just for technical reasons, an odd number was required, so it was impossible to multiply by 2, 4, 6, and so on. 
Well, in the closest combination to 500, it turned out to be 3 by 5. By 7, that's 525. There are a lot of technical details there and division, not multiplication, was actually performed. But for us, this is not the essence of the matter. The main thing is that 45 lines were not shown at this time, the beam was coming back. And it turns out that 480 lines remained visible. Value. The most interesting thing is that this standard is still used in, as you can see, even reflected in the numbers of formats. In the 80s, Japanese high vision 1125 lines began to appear in high definition television, European HD Mac 1250 lines. But these were all analog systems, complex and not very convenient, so they could not withstand any competition with the fully digital American HDV. It provided for two permissions at once, 720 and 1080 lines. And its main advantage was, digital data can be compressed, which greatly reduces the data transmission channel. Compression was provided by the IMPEC2 algorithm, but it encodes everything in blocks of 16 by 16 pixels, so each side had to be divided by 16, which already limits the choice. The aspect ratio was determined to be 16 by 9 as an average between a conventional television standard and a cinematic wide angle. But if you wanted two resolutions that differ from each other by one and a half times, then well, there was, in fact, one option, 720,080. Well, here, not without shoals, 1080 is not divided into the 16th. Therefore, 1088 lines were encoded, and during playback the extra ones were cut off. What is efficiency? That's it. Well, for dessert, since we talked about analog devices like that, Uncle Mitya will assemble a cool gadget for you. We are looking. You know, now in every smartphone, the dialer icon looks like an old handset. Here it is with kelomorphism in all its glory. And now we are going to assemble something similar to an analog phone. But the most interesting thing is that the main component there will be charcoal tablets from the pharmacy. We also need foil, cups, glue, pencil, mortar and pestle. From this we will assemble a carbon microphone, a power source, a simple speaker, wires with crocodiles and a long double wire. The scheme is simple, everything is connected in one circuit, so the main thing is to make a high quality microphone. In a mortar, grind the coal to a powder state. From the foil we cut out two such details for the size of the cup. We stick one on the outside of one, and the other inside the other. Inside this, we fill up the coal so that it covers the entire bottom. Insert another cup so that the pieces of foil do not come into contact with each other. We attach crocodiles to them and that's it. The microphone is ready. I recommend attaching a cup to the speaker too, so it will increase the volume. We put everything together according to the scheme and check how everything works. I left the speaker with the battery at home, and by the way, I threw a hundred meter long wire from the balcony to the street and there I will connect the microphone. So the distance is quite decent. My sister Alice stays at home. She will record on the recoder what I will say there at all. Actually, that's all set up. So, the wire of the house is about 70 meters, probably. Let's test pass an anecdote about Putin. Attention! Anecdote about Putin. Navalny comes somehow, not Putin, and they order the same cocktail for themselves, then it will be. Why doesn't he drink it for some reason? Navalny asks. That's it, that's it. We're done. That's it. Don't worry, everything is fine. The only thing I forgot to tell you is how everything works. An electric current is constantly flowing through the circuit, and sound vibrations cause the coal particles to change their position, from which the microphone resistance also begins to change in time with the sound vibration. From this, the electric current also begins to change, pulsate and when it passes through the speaker, causes it to make a sound. For dual communication, you need two microphones, two speakers, but the principle is absolutely the same. And by the way, such carbon microphones were used in analog phones as early as the beginning of the 21st century. Now, of course, no one needs it anymore. But you know, if you follow the wire, then no one will listen to you. Well, besides, it's interesting to collect it yourself. You can try it. You can collect such constructors, more about them in the description. And for this, everything at my reception is logical. Everything that surrounds us is not just like that. But of course, you can hardly keep track of everything. So I hope I have satisfied my curiosity about the most interesting questions.
but do not stop your curiosity, because only it leads us to unexpected discoveries, impressions of something new, insight and a wonderful sense of comprehension of the truth. Keep it up, ask the right questions, and you'll be fine. And that's it. See you soon in the next issues. For now.